Hello. Odie Hawkins. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good to be with you once again. Uh, I assume we're going to continue where we were yesterday. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I would like to say, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you to uh, uh, fans. I guess I could call them fans, but people who've read my books in Africa. Uh, several people in Ghana have uh, contacted me. I'm always amazed at how how beautifully and how quickly the international communi communication systems operate these days. Uh, my friends in Asia, uh, my friend uh, Brother Xu in Taiwan, and some people on mainland China, in mainland China, and of course uh, the Europeans, because I lived in Spain for a while in the 80s, I got to know a number of people. One of them was a woman named Serafina Sanchez Bu Gomez and her kid uh, Alberto and the people in the neighborhood uh, in the town I lived in, in southeastern, yeah, that's right, the southern section of Spain called Alicante. It's the doorway to old Spain, to Cordoba and Seville and so forth. Anyway, uh, it's been gratifying to hear from them. And of course, people come at me, coming at me from uh, different places in the United States saying, why haven't you done this before? So okay, you do it when you do it. Uh, yesterday when we ended this, I was talking with uh, you about a book that I wrote called Kwanzaa for Conrad and the Survival Tango. Yes. The impressionistic photo was taken by, of course, Zola Selena Hawkins. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a book of short stories, but the, the main story, the leading story, is about a man named, well, I won't mention his name, but the man was schizophrenic, uh, severely schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm not mentioning his name is, is because he is, in a sense, a uh, representative of thousands of thousands. I'll call him Fred or Freddy. So he's, uh, he's uh, a person who represents many, many Freddies who have been suffering with schizophrenia uh, for many years. And he wound up being the lead story in this series of stories. Uh, well, his name was Conrad. I'll just, I'll just Thank say. You. Thank his you. His name was Conrad. And uh, in this particular story, the lead story, Conrad spends about 25 years on the streets of Los Angeles. At one point, according to his own confession, he spent 25 years living near a crack in the sidewalk. We've known several people in downtown LA in what they want to call the skid row, actually several skid rows. And one man in particular, I, 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 I nicknamed the Yoga King because he had a way of sitting on a box on a corner and leaning back, holding his knee for eight, 12 hours at a time. I think that's called catatonic schizophrenia. Uh, eventually, of course, he disappeared. We don't know whether he died or he, whatever happened. They might have taken him away in, in a trash bin. Uh, there are other stories in this book that I think are worth worth reading, Zola, Selena, and I took the book to the, <laughs> to, the, to the mission downtown, which does such a wonderful job of helping people with their problems and so forth. Uh, we made the manuscript available to them because we wanted to make a contribution to the work that they were doing. But they saw a game in it. Uh, the Los Angeles Mission. And I don't know if I can blame them other than the fact that you've become so 
suspicious that you might become paranoid. You know, it was unfortunate. The staff was very, uh, very supportive to it, but the legal department wanted us to do all the work and for them to get all the money and for, out, for us to fill out certain paperwork. And so, unfortunately, our idea, good idea, had to be killed in the pile of bureaucratic administrative. You listen to the legal arm of Hawkins and Hawkins. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, we uh, dedicated the book to them in any case uh, and let it go with that. I mean, you can't force people to accept things that they're suspicious about. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of these books because the reviews that I received concerning some of them are kind of uh, bland and inadequate, to put it to put it bluntly. This particular book, for example, the Snake Doctor, uh, the photograph of our friend Brother Bahati. The photograph is by Zola Selena Hawkins, and it was taken on a bluff in Long Beach, right on Ocean Boulevard, next to a big tree that has since been cut down. So it winds up being sort of a historical photo in a way. Uh, just the, just the way that she wound up having him take the photograph is the way that a lot of uh, very ingenious photographers get people to do things that they didn't think they wanted to do. In this case, she just simply said to him, Bahati, get over next to the tree and take your shirt off. And <laughs> as you can see, <laughs> Not quite. that's okay. what he did. <laughs> But how he has the look and uh, mm -hmm. everything that I had wanted to have grace the cover of a book that uh, I wrote about African mysticism, spiritualism, whatever else you might add to that. Uh, the, the, the catalyst in my head was being exposed to so many uh, wolfman stories and to Transylvanian zombies and all the rest of the Eastern European, Western European stuff that was uh, pertinent to those who relate to Eastern and Western European zombie stuff. And, you know, as an African American, I'm always conscious of the fact that as an African-American writer, which makes me a historian automatically because I'm doing our story, not his story. His story is not our story. So in this case, I'm dividing, making an effort to show where the division happens, where the split might occur. Uh, I don't find any particular fright thing happening when I see Frankenstein. Uh, 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 El Tromposo, for my Spanish-speaking friends, El Tromposo, alias La Bestia, is Frankenstein. And I'm not going to say his name, other than the fact that he lies pathologically. Guess who that is? And lives in a house called White. Guess who that is? So, uh, I'm not unacquainted with well, people who try to force their sense of mystery and sense of suspense and sense of uh, all that they're about on us. In this case, I decided, I decided to try to tell the story. Well, I don't want to say try. I've told the story of a man who made a deal with the, an original Tarzan. In brief, a young man, his, his name might have been uh, Spike Lee. <laughs> Spike Lee goes to Africa and he meets a person up in the, the northern section of Ghana. It happens to be Ghana, it could be Cote d'Ivoire, it could be uh, Nigeria. 
and talks to him about something he wants to do. Oh, pineapple juice, I'm telling you. He makes a deal with Asiafo. Asiafo is a wizard. Asiafo was cursed early in his life for having for having relations with his mother. And uh, that there's no worse term that could possibly be used, be used in Africa than saying that someone has had sexual intercourse with their mothers. Here in America, of course, we casually refer to each other as people who've had intercourse with their mothers. If you follow my drift, I don't want to say the word, the M word, the MF word, but this is where that sense of uh, blasphemy comes from. If that's something you can do, if, if, if you can do something that bad, then you deserve to be called that. This Spike Lee kind of character meets a Tarzan figure who has been unjustly accused of having this relationship with his mother, but he didn't, and he was banished to the forest. In this forest, I'm, I'm, I'm dedicating the book to the first African Tarzan, the first real Tarzan. He's not swinging through the trees and yelling, oh, and all the rest of the Johnny Weiss Miller madness. He's just simply living there, and he does things like uh, investigate and find out about uh, medicines that are not known. Uh, he doesn't suffer from malaria or any other modern diseases that afflict us and affect us. He is not living a wholesome life because he's living a lonesome life. But at the same time, he's living. And there's so much that people who have been banished, but at the same time survive, not by using their wits, but by becoming intuitive to, to nature. And this is what happens. This Spike Lee type character wants to make a uh, breakout film. He talks to Asiafo, meeting him in the jungle. Asiafo knows things and uh, suggests that he might be able to help him. Spike Lee, of course, goes away thinking, well, wait a minute, wait, wait. How is some guy who's dressed in banana leaves in the forest going to help me achieve, uh, uh, help me get financing for this film I want to make? It's the end of the film. It's called My Grandfather's Eyes. Mm -hmm. And the, the film is about a boy who sees life through his grandfather's eyes. Mm -hmm. Very unusual subject. It's something that would not be considered mainstream theater fair here because, as you know, in America, with film being done on the assembly line basis, except for the contribution that African-American filmmakers have made and some other people of color, we've been automatically reduced to whatever it is that came off the assembly line. The deal is made. Asiafo receives uh, his satisfaction by saying, I was able to help you do it. The problem is, or that develops, is that years later, Spike Lee has to explain to his family and to other people how he came to receive the funds, how he came to receive the funds, how he came to know what he knows, and so forth and so on. Uh, it ends in a... In a in an interesting way, I think, because the son goes back to where the father went and finds out uh, some things that happened to the sons of Asiafo. 
and uh, that's what we like I say, it's, it's, it's our story. <laughs> it's our story in the supernatural. And when I say supernatural, I'm not saying something that's so weird and, and otherworldly that it couldn't happen because we see supernatural things happen all the time. The third book having to do with this subject matter is the book uh, called The Snake. No. And the snake. This was the first. That was the second. Oh, okay. This is in. A, this is, I, I'm I'm dealing with the duos and trilogies. I went to live in Ghana in 1992. I really didn't go to live. I, I didn't go to visit. Uh, I sneaked into the place on a uh, two month. Oh. I sneaked into the place on a two-month visa. I've been handed another book called The Snake. It seems I've been kind of involved with snakes for a while. A lot of snakes here. Uh, so that was the first, and then the snake doctor followed. And then Snake Dog follows. Putting things in the right chronological order. Uh, I'm so glad you reminded me of this because once again, once again, this cover design was by the inimitable Zola Selena. And as you can see from the outline of Africa, with the flag of America going across it and a Viennese snake rattling down through it, we've had a difficult relationship during the whole course of our history. Uh, the snake basically follows the same avenue as the snake doctor, except it's a little bit more raw. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more raw. The, uh, the person who wants to have something done, no matter where it is you are or what tradition you come from, it seems that you must be willing to give up something to get something. What I found was interesting is that you wrote The Snake while in Africa. That is interesting. Because, okay, yes. Ooh, ooh. Okay, and so after I finished reading The Snake, I wanted to know, well, what happened to his son? And then you wrote The Snake Doctor. And I was like, wow. Zola Selena, my wife, the artist who did this, mm -hmm. is, a, is a remarkable person because she's able to remember details <laughs> and circumstances and things that I've long since forgotten. <laughs> I, look at this. I have forgotten I wrote the book. And, and the reason she makes the point is that when I did write it, when I started writing it in 1992 in Ghana, I was living in Ghana at the time. Uh, I was having malaria so badly. It's a, it's a very bad kind of thing to have. Uh, if you can imagine uh, an atomic bomb flu that takes hold of your whole body, coupled to the fact that your head might be blowing off with a double-grained migraine, in addition to, and on and on and on. Uh, you could die from it. I didn't die, obviously. But uh, in writing The Snake, I was making a big story out of a small thing that happened between me and a shopkeeper in a section of, Osu, uh, a section of Accra called Osu, where I lived. Uh, a man who owned a small business, a uh, woodworking shop, wanted to ask me or ask my help in getting money. He wasn't trying to borrow money from me, but he was simply saying, Mr. O'Day, they called me O'Day, Mr. O'Day, how is it that I can get some more money to, uh, to buy myself a, a uh, new car and to enlarge my business and also to get another wife in that daughter, he said. I had to explain to him that 
I was receiving remittances that sometimes were delayed by snowstorms that I didn't know anything about, by hurricanes that I've never seen, and by other means of delaying my money. And it went on that way. He must have consulted somebody else or some other forces or some other people because there was a newspaper article printed, I saved it for a long time, that showed that my friend had been caught pulling money out of a snake's mouth who was coiled up in a chair in his shop. This is after he had enlarged his business, he had bought another car, and I believe he was on the verge of buying a rent, uh, marrying another wife. So uh, this, this has elements of what the story is about, and uh, I'm determined to trip on this path because I've gotten to know through my relationship with various people in the religion and uh, what some people call uh, Santeria in Cuba, uh, Santos in, in, in Puerto Rico, uh, Candomblé in Brazil, Shango in Trinidad, the religion here in the United States. The, re the religion in the United States has taken different forms. The people in the South, specifically New Orleans, has lab labeled it hoodoo, which means that we've had a natural branch off. But this is a story for another time and for... One question. Okay, who published the snake? I believe it was a priest that she oh, took a divination to decide which book she, of yours she she was. Chief Fama. Oh, okay. Chief Fama, who was a, a, an incredible person, she published this book, and uh, she is an Ifa, a priest of Ifa. For those of uh, for those who are listening to me or watching what I'm saying, we know that. Uh, Ifa priests are normally, usually, male. So she had to go up against many, many cultural obstacles in order to become an Ifa priest. And uh, I do nothing but salute her and salute her and salute her. Uh, there may be people right now who uh, do not think of her as a legitimate priest, but she's written several books and she has done thorough research. Most of the books uh, have very complicated uh, Ifa explanations of things. Uh, I would like to suggest for those who have the time and want to get into the research of what Ifa is all about would be well rewarded because uh, it's a practically unknown system of divination for most people in, in the West. Uh, we think that doing the, the Ouija board is complicated. Uh, now, it's a little bit beyond that. So, the snake. The snake. Snake, and then the, the snake doctor. By Zola Selena Hawkins. Yes, and then the snake doctor. Is the second. And the snake doctor. Follows. And then ending the day with Kwanzaa for Conrad. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a brief note because also. This has been pushed on me. Someone says, uh, what, what are you talking about? And I'm saying to those who ask that question, I'm talking about 34 books that I've written. And enough people have said that they're not, they're not well known enough. These are the people who feel that the books have to be reviewed in the New York Times, uh, book section or they have to be reviewed by the usual suspects in order for them to know something about them. I'm saying that this appeal is to people on a broader base. Those who are involved with Facebook, incidentally uh, while I'm on it, I'm appealing especially to those members of my family who 
revere Facebook because in many cases, very often, the only time I hear from them is through Facebook. So I'm pushing it back on you all. I'm pushing it back on the Price family, the Hawkins family. That means I'm talking to about 6,000 people immediately <laughs> because that's how many cousins, uh, nieces and nephews and cousins, first, second, third, fourth, and so on. Andrew, Andrew, that encompasses 1,500. My sister Louise, who had 11 children, and uh, many of her 11 children had a few more, and then they have had a few more. So we're talking about a, a, a sizable constituency. I'm saying to you guys, as you sip your Hennessy, and I sip my pineapple juice, go to Barnes & Nobles, go to Amazon.com, use all of the cyber strength that exists within you, that you know all about, to order books by your Uncle Odie. And if there are others out there who consider me their uncle, pick up a book and... <laughs> Welcome to the family. <laughs> Welcome to the family. Thank you so much. See you next time. See you, See next, you next time. time. All right. Enjoy your juice. Pineapple juice. Pineapple juice. I say.